We've been focusing so hard on rebuilding our engine, it's probably easy to forget about the car that it's supposed to be going in. We picked up this 1978 Pontiac Firebird Esprit back in 2014, and it's gone through some changes here and there, but nothing like what we're about to put it through. It started off as a project and learning experience, and pretty quickly transitioned into a daily driver when I didn't really have anything else. Despite all this use, I've only managed to put about 6,000 miles on the clock, and while I'm not sure how many are on the body, the Chevy 350 engine was a fresh rebuild back when I bought the car. Overall, it's in great shape, and even though a lot of the clear coat is gone and some of the paint is getting a little bit flaky, it was a Nevada car for at least some of its life, and there is very little rust to be found. I maybe haven't treated it quite as well as I could have, but at least so far I've managed to avoid driving it on salty winter roads. I mostly wanted to give it a good cleaning to get all the dirt off from underneath, but it's also a good way to re-familiarize myself with the car as I've left it sitting for more than a few months. We'll grab a battery from the garage and drop it into its tray so that we can hopefully hear this thing roar to life one last time before the engine comes out. It's a mechanical fuel pump and that carburetor is certainly quite dry, so it might take a bit of cranking to get fuel up to it, but once it's there and we give it a bit of throttle... <laughs> This carburetor doesn't have any kind of a choke, so it has to be manually held at about 1500 or 2000 RPM for 30 or so seconds to warm everything up, but then we can pop it in gear and get it rolling. Since it had been sitting for a while before this, and is probably going to be sitting for a long time after this, I decided to let the engine warm up and raise the RPM to make some fun noises as a sort of send-off. Since I probably haven't mentioned it in a while, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this engine. The only issue is that I just wanted a bigger one. Despite some minor difficulties with it early on, I ended up really happy with the Wind 144 blower, and it made the car a totally different animal once you put your foot down. Even though that supercharger will be coming out along with the engine, it definitely won't be the last you'll see of it on this channel because I'm still a pretty big fan. In all honesty, every time I've made a big change to this car, I've ended up regretting it for a good while, because once the kinks have been worked out on a setup, it is just so much fun to drive. So, hearing it run one last time was really bittersweet. It was kind of painful in a weird way. Pulling it into the garage felt like laying down on the operating table, not quite sure what outcome lies ahead. What if I end up missing this setup, and regretting all of the changes that we're about to make? Unfortunately, there's no easy remedy for those feelings, and they are not without reason. We already have a decent sized hole in the hood, but it's just the top of the carburetor and air cleaner that stick through it, so visibility is not actually that bad. I'm not exactly sure how much worse we're about to make it, but it will probably have to be a constant consideration while driving. We're also going to be switching out the radiator for a larger one, and hoping that it's enough to keep a supercharged big block cool. Then there's the matter of the wiring, which is currently a bit of a mess, but it does work. In order to clean that up and add new circuits, we're going to be just about completely rewiring the engine bay. And, of course, there are things we're not changing, like the transmission, that we're just gonna have to hope are up to the task. We're really asking for a lot from a car that came with a Smog Era 305. Its two-barrel LG3 engine was rated at an asphalt-burning 145 horsepower. And with the engine we're putting in, we should probably be tripling that. It's been a dream of mine to have a big block Firebird, and consequences be damned, we're gonna make it happen. 
The next step towards that goal is getting the Chevy 350 out of the car, and to do that we need to remove the hood. Which, if you somehow haven't noticed, is a very big and heavy piece of sheet metal. I didn't have anyone to help me with it, so I set up cardboard that let me slide the hood up onto the roof of the car, probably without scratching anything up too bad. This did work, but it also really sucked and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that anyone else take this approach. But at least we have good access to pretty much everything in the engine bay and we can start taking things apart. We're going to need to empty the cooling system, which we can start by opening up the drain at the bottom of the radiator. We'll let that do its job and get to work on the accessories and top end of the engine. We'll start by disconnecting the carburetor's linkage, vacuum, and fuel hoses so that we can remove it from the supercharger. Then off comes the belt and the four bolts holding down the supercharger itself. We'll be capping and taping off openings as we go, trying to keep everything as clean as possible. Next we'll remove the radiator hoses, and then the plug wires from the distributor, cutting off all of the zip tie wire separators as we go, and finally pulling the distributor itself out of the engine. Then we'll do a bit of tidying up, making sure all of the wires and hoses are disconnected and as far out of the way as possible. Over on the radiator, we need to unmount and disconnect the fan wiring, overflow hose, and the transmission cooler lines. Then all we have to do is spin out the two bolts holding in those custom upper radiator mounts, and the entire assembly can be lifted up and out of the car. We'll also go ahead and remove the overflow tank, because with the bigger engine and wide alternator mount, it's not going to be able to stay where it is. Next up are the power steering lines, which we can loosen at the gearbox using a flare knot wrench. And with the lines disconnected and capped, we will cover up the ports on the box. Then we'll lift up the front of the car and set it down on jack stands. This will give us access to a few things we need to disconnect from underneath, like the exhaust collector bolts. These can be a little tricky to get to, but a swivel socket and creative use of extensions does get the job done. Once all three of the bolts have been removed from the passenger side, we can slide out the gasket from between the pipes. And we'll repeat that same process to disconnect the exhaust on the driver's side. We'll also go ahead and remove the bolts for the transmission inspection cover, and get it out of the way. Now for something I've been dreading, which is removing the header bolts. Thanks to the bad access to them and continued tightening they required, I had rounded off at least one on each side, and I figured they weren't going to come out easily. As expected, the open-ended wrench is slipping, but fortunately these bolts have an inner hex and came with this ball and socket. Except that starts to strip out too. As a last ditch effort, we'll go ahead and use both tools at once, and what do you know, it was just enough to crack the bolt loose. And after that, it unthreaded peacefully. Fortunately, the other five bolts on the passenger side didn't put up too much of a fight, and pretty soon we had the header separated from the engine. Unfortunately, without lifting the car much higher off the ground, the headers can't come out the bottom of the engine bay, so they're a bit stuck. Instead of messing with that, we're just going to remove the starter to make a bit more room. It's not an encouraging start that this rubber boot fell right off, but no matter, we'll loosen the main and solenoid wire connections, pull those out of the way, and remove the nut and bolt holding on the starter brace. Back underneath, we'll remove the two mounting bolts and drop the starter free from the engine, which gives us plenty of space to remove the header without a fight. Over on the driver's side, thanks to the dual tool strategy, we managed to get all the bolts out and the header separated from the engine, but we did end up removing the oil dipstick tube and number three spark plug to drop the header out the bottom of the car. Examining the header gaskets, it looks like at least one of these cylinders was leaking at some point, so I probably wouldn't use this style of gasket again. To continue with disassembly, we'll need to remove the torque converter bolts, and to do so, we'll have to turn the crankshaft until we can see one, remove it, turn the crank, remove the second one, turn the crank, and remove the third and final bolt. 
Once we verify that the torque converter is in fact disconnected, we'll get the floor jack underneath the transmission pan to hold it up as we remove the bell housing bolts. There are six of them holding the engine to the transmission, and as we loosen the last of the bolts, we can see the bell housing start to separate, which is a very good sign that it's gonna pull off of the engine with no trouble. We'll leave one of the bolts partway in for now to make sure they don't fall apart until we're ready for them to. It's about time to wheel out the engine hoist, except we've got a bit of a problem. Even with the hydraulic cylinder slammed against the license plate, the hoist arm is too short and the front of the car is just way too long. We could get it closer by removing the front fascia, but instead I think we can just turn the crane sideways. It'll be close and we'll have to remove the driver's side front wheel, but once we've done that, the hoist can roll all the way up to the fender and it reaches no problem. So we might have to do some creative engine maneuvering, but that should work. We'll get the load leveler bolted to each of the cylinder heads, hook that onto the crane, and start lifting. But of course we won't get it very far until we unbolt the engine mounts. With the engine's weight off of them, they come out nice and easy. Then out comes that last transmission bolt, and we'll start slowly, carefully lifting the engine up. Once it's just barely off of its mounts, we can lift up with the transmission jack and pry the engine away from the bell housing. With the engine freed, we can lift it fully above its mounts, but now we're running into a bit of a problem where we need the engine to slide forward against the wheel of the sideways hoist. My unelegant solution was just to hook a strap around the hanging chain and force the hoist wheels to slide sideways on the floor. Which worked, but was kind of sketchy since there was the risk of tipping the whole thing over. After inching the engine forward, we can continue to go up, making very sure that we're not hooked on anything in the engine bay. Once the engine is raised up pretty high and mostly clear, we can reposition the hoist, raise it up high enough for the oil pan to clear the fender, and carefully, slowly pull the whole thing away from the car. Honestly, that whole process went way smoother and quicker than I was anticipating. It definitely helps that most of the parts weren't in the car for all that long and hadn't yet had the chance to become seized. We'll be setting the engine down on a mover's dolly with a ratchet strap wrapped around to make sure it doesn't tip over. And once it's been unchained, we can roll it away. Since the engine was in the car when I bought it, this is actually the first time I've seen it in its entirety. It's been working hard dragging this car around the last few years and has done a very admirable job. It's gonna take a bit of a rest now, I don't actually have plans for it in the future, but I'm sure it'll come in handy to have around. And with it finally outside of the car, we can see exactly what we're working with. It's a pretty sizable engine bay, and you can appreciate that all the more when there's no engine in it. We can also now see the torque converter we were talking about in the last episode and can verify that it is in fact a 10 and 3 quarter inch bolt pattern. I believe it to be a remanufactured converter and it seems like a factory style stall speed, but I don't really know much about it. The Turbo 350 transmission came with the car and while it does have the correct tail shaft housing for a Pontiac application, I think it's probably not original. Regardless, it does seem a bit tired, and hopefully we don't immediately destroy it. Since we're going from a small block Chevy to a big block Chevy, there aren't all that many changes we need to make, and we can even keep the existing engine mounts. On the frame side, our polyurethane equipped clamshells we installed a few years back, and on the engine we've got factory style stamped steel brackets. These were purchased new by the car's previous owner who installed the engine. We'll be transferring those over to our 454 before it goes in. We will need to take care of a few things before that happens, so in the meantime we will be suspending the transmission from above using a board and ratchet strap. We'll also have to do some organizing of parts because there was a lot that came off of the engine. Some things we'll be using with the new setup and some will get stored away for later. But before that happens, let's make a few comparisons.
First up, here is the Wyand 144 versus the BNM 250 Supercharger. They are basically siblings, both being derivatives of BNM's old power chargers. The 144 has 8 and 5 8 inch long rotors, while the 250 has 15 inch rotors. The 144 also has that long snout and uses a 10 groove belt instead of an 8 mm pitch toothed belt. The newer Wyand also uses sealed ball bearings in the rear instead of needle bearings like on the BNM. The last major change is the 144's built in carburetor mount versus the removable adapter plate on the 250. And of course, along with the size difference comes a weight difference as well. Last episode, the 250 came in at 47.6 pounds, and the 144 is quite a bit lighter at 38.3. And that's including the belt tensioner, which adds at least 7 pounds to the 250. Those differences aren't the only ones we're interested in, let's take a look at the engines side by side. With the bell housing surfaces lined up, you can see how much longer the big block is, and how much taller it is, since they're pretty much even up at the valve covers and the 350 is sitting on quite a few wooden boards. And just like the superchargers, along with that size comes weight. To make a good comparison, we'll be removing the alternator and power steering pump, and before we do, I just want to make a little note about these mounts. Way back when installing the supercharger, I ended up with this summit mount, and I have hated every second I've had to use it. The alternator had to be filed to fit at all, and the slot is too close to the corner. This makes it pretty much impossible for a bolt to grip on both sides, which ends up bending the bolts, and then you have to add a couple extra, and it just becomes a mess. As for the power steering mount, I think it may have been like this when I bought the car, but the water pump mounting location is broken and the threads are stripped out, so it's just got a bolt going through it with a nut on the other side that is really unpleasant to get to. All around, I am not sorry to see the engine without those accessories mounted to it. But without them, how much does it weigh? The 454 came in at 601.8 pounds, while the 350 is only 446.3. And yes, the 350 doesn't have a starter, but it also has an iron water pump compared to the aluminum pump on the 454. So this is an a perfect apples to apples comparison, but the difference is right around 150 pounds. It gets even worse when we put the supercharger and carburetors on top of the 454 and compare its fully assembled weight of 707 pounds to the 350s at only 512. That's 200 pounds between them. I sure hope the suspension is up for it, and this new engine better make up for that difference with power. Hopefully helping with that are the long tube headers, so let's figure out how to make this exhaust work. I shouldn't have to tell you which of these is the old header, but what's clear with the two side by side is that the big block headers are a little bit longer. This is true for both, although the driver's side ones are even more different. The exhaust system on the car is a 2.5 inch kit that I bought from Summit back in 2015, and while it's a bit on the small side for the new engine, I think it's probably good enough to reuse. To get these pipes to fit the new headers, we will need to shorten them, and we'll start that process at the front exhaust mount. With that side hanging loosely, we can unbolt and remove the band clamp back at the muffler, and underneath there is our major problem. Originally, the system was held together with U-bolt clamps, but the pipe connections kept leaking, and when I tried to tighten those bolts down more, all I succeeded in doing was crimping the pipes together. That pipe is in there really good, and I think the best option is just to cut it out. We were going to have to shorten these pipes anyway, and as long as we leave a little bit sticking out of the muffler for us to clamp the new pipes to, we should be able to get away with this. With the pipe fully separated from the muffler, we can finish unbolting the mount and remove it from the car, before using a bit of back and forth hammering to remove that last bit of slip fit tubing. All of that orange gunk is copper high temp RTV, which probably did help stop the leak, but didn't make it any easier to separate these parts. 
You can also see that the cut is kind of in the middle of that crimped section, which means I may not have removed enough of the muffler, and that remaining bit of pipe might not want to come out. I tried cutting through the inside pipe, using a chisel to deform it, twisting it around with a pry bar, welding a bolt to the inside of the pipe to give us a place to really torque it, which did get it to turn, but not all that much before the pipe was just bending. But it was enough to grab on with our trusty vice grip DIY slide hammer and get it moving. Eventually, enough that we were able to pry out that mangled hunk of steel. Ha! That extraction was anything but graceful, but lucky us, we have a rematch waiting over on the driver's side. Just like before, we'll remove the clamp and get out the saw, only this time we're cutting a little bit farther back. And once we were most of the way through, the blade decided that it had had about enough. But it was so close, we were able to unbolt the mount and twist the pipe the rest of the way off. And, very fortunately for us, this time we were able to just pry that last piece out of the muffler. The other end is holding fast to the pipe, but since we'll be shortening that later on, we're not going to worry about it right now. We will finish getting the mufflers ready though, because even though we extracted those pipes, it doesn't mean we can just put it back together. We'll use one of these pipe expanders that you tighten down on to push these plates outward, to hopefully return these to round. With that in the muffler, we will tighten down on it, and between the tool and a file to deburr the edge, we were able to get it back to a nice slip fit with this piece of two and a half inch tubing. Eventually. We'll repeat that process on the driver's side, and that takes care of the exhaust for now. So let's focus back on the engine bay. We'll be taking the plastic covers off of the steering shaft because while the engine was installed, I never managed to find the room to do it. The main reason for this was to check on the steering shaft coupler since I'm sure it is original, but it actually seems to be doing just fine. Since there is so much space in here, it seems like now's the time to see if we can fit a bigger radiator in the car. There's really nothing wrong with the old one, it always worked just fine for the small block, but I'm worried we might now outpace it. It's certainly old, but it doesn't seem to be from this car since none of the mounts line up, and based on their locations, I'd say it's bigger than what came in the car from the factory. To upgrade it, I picked out this radiator and fan shroud set. It was listed as fitting all sorts of things, including many full-size GM trucks. What it didn't claim to fit were any Camaros or Firebirds. I picked this radiator by carefully measuring the core support opening and finding the largest one that could possibly fit there. The only way to know for sure though is to test fit it, and before doing that we will install the fan shroud. This uses and included these 12 inch generic fans that you see pretty much everywhere. To give us the best chances of success, we will do a little bit of massaging on the core support. Okay, maybe more than a little. And then we can carefully drop the radiator in from above. Even sitting on top of those mounts, the height isn't terrible, but it is rubbing on both sides of the core support, so we're gonna need to do a bit more hammering. In fact, some downright aggressive hammering. But after moving all of that sheet metal, it does clear all the way around. And even if it were sitting fully on the core support, it wouldn't be touching on the sides. The last remaining question is whether we'll have enough room for the belt drive on the front of the engine. It's about 32 inches from the transmission bell housing to the fan motors, and the end of that 3 inch Gilmer pulley comes out to about 31 and 5 eighths. So it's going to be pretty close, but there should be just enough room there to get the belts on and off with the engine installed. We'll wait until later to make the radiator mounts. Right now we just wanted to make sure it was actually possible to fit it in there. And while it was... We hammered this flat, enough to make the radiator fit, but in the process, I folded this piece totally over, but also broke all the pinch welds. Realistically, it probably doesn't matter, but just to make sure we're not taking strength out of the core support, we'll be welding those tabs back down. 
The driver's side didn't look quite as bad, but we may as well give it the same treatment. And we'll cover that up with some black spray paint, so hopefully nobody sees the crimes. Speaking of those, we'll start unwrapping the wiring and figure out what is needed and what isn't. Most of this will have to do with the engine installed, but at least we can start planning for it now. We'll also take a good look at the trans cooler lines, and yeah, they're not the prettiest things in the world, but they don't seem to have any new holes in them, so we're just going to use them as is. And that actually seems like just about everything. It's been a bit sad removing the power plant that's been so good to me, but we're on to bigger and better, or at least bigger, things. We've got to start prepping the 454 for install, but I think that's going to have to wait until next time. And that's why this thing doesn't normally get washed. Oh, I got fit in there. Uh, I love this car. It's part of the family. Doom, doom, yeah. Doom.